Record case people versus Brandon Martin, RAF 1506112. Mr. Martin present with both counsel. People are present, all members of the jury and alternates are present. Mr. Welburn. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Kaplan. Good afternoon. Your position at the University of South Florida uh, is that you are a manager in the Advanced Visualization Center? That's the title, yeah. How long have you been doing that job? Uh, about nine years. You're also a student at USF? I am. How long have you been a student at USF? It's 20, well, I was a student in 2014 for the master's and I'm currently a student, so maybe about four years. I'm still a student. Yeah. Four years? Okay. And you're uh, trying to get your PhD there? PhD, yep. How long is that process to get a PhD? Uh, it can take anywhere from three years up to eight years. And where are you in that process? Uh, I'm towards well, about four years, but at the end of the PhD. I've done all my research, done all the coursework, <clears throat> done all the dissertation hours. And the PhD that you are seeking is in, I think you said biomedical and engineering? Yes. Okay. Does that PhD have anything to do with uh, the skulls that you created uh, for this case? Um, anything to do, I, it, it deals with 3D printing and digital modeling. Any part of your dissertation have to do with the models that you created in this case? No. Have you ever testified before? No. Never testified in a civil matter? No. Never testified in a criminal case? No. You mentioned earlier that you've done some work with law enforcement, uh, I believe you said in in Massachusetts, is yes. that right? Yes. Okay, when was that? 2008, I believe. 2008? Yes. Okay, so that was 12 years ago? Yep. Were you working for the University of South Florida at that point? No, I was the Director of Computer Animation and Interactive Media at Boston University. And that work that you did had nothing to do with uh, creating 3D models like you did in this case, correct? It, it dealt with creating 3D models, yes. And not with skulls like you did in this case, correct? No, it was a different process. Well, different application or technique, I guess. Well, that was a picture that you created, correct? It was a 3D model that I created. Okay, but it was also uh, more of just a, a face or some sort of uh, sketch or identification process, correct? It was a 3D co composite sculpt based on a victim's uh, description to me. And the uh, model or photo that you created uh, was not depicting anyone that had any injuries, correct? It, it was not. You stated that you have uh, created 3D projects in the past, uh, working and collaborating with other people within the USF community, correct? Yes. I think you had mentioned that uh, times you've worked uh, in, uh, with individuals in the paleontology department? Yes. Is that right? Yes? Yes. And recreating uh, dinosaurs and bones and things of that nature? Correct. And when you are doing that, you actually have the tangible item that's been recovered in front of you, correct? Uh, sometimes. Some, a fossil is a flattened out uh, specimen that demonstrates some of the anatomy, not all of it. And so then you have that tangible item and then you try to recreate what the animal would look like? Yes. And would you be recreating injuries to the animal as well? Not that I can recall, no. How many times in your career have you created a 3D skull like this uh, involving uh, injuries as you have uh, done here? I'm not uh, typically asked to recreate skulls with injuries. Okay, so that is, you've never done that before? Uh, not that I recall. How many times in your career have you created a 3D skull like you did here based solely upon photos? Uh, 
none without none with injuries. So the way that you created these skulls is essentially the first time you've done it with this process, correct? With applying the injury to the skulls, yes. Okay. You mentioned that you do work at your university uh, with their forensic department, is that correct? Yes. And it's your understanding that that forensic department at USF somehow works with law enforcement? They do uh, work with law enforcement. Yeah. Okay. And are you, do you know whether or not any of the work that you've done with them has been given to law enforcement? Um, I, I believe some of it has, yes. Okay, but you're, you don't know which cases? I don't recall which cases. I've done a lot of work. And you've never been called to testify or as a witness? No, typically I, might, I work in the background and I provide for the professor, uh, forensic scientist that needs it, and then they're the ones that use it. Okay. In that work that you've done, have you ever created uh, 3D replicas of skulls like you did in this case? I've created 3D replicas of skulls, not with trauma. They typically already have trauma because they're uh, of missing persons. So the remains are, are there and they exhibit the trauma already. Earlier today, we were talking uh, about the replica skulls that you had created and being able to determine accuracy. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Do you remember that? I remember, yes. And you said that you were unable to uh, determine the accuracy because you did not have the actual skulls available to you. Is that right? Correct. So what you were relying upon in this case was several photos that were sent to you from the district attorney's office along with the medical examiner's report, yeah. Okay. And so you had the autopsy report as well? Yes. Okay. Did you ever speak to the medical examiner? I did not. With regard to the 3D replica of Mr. Swanson's skull, you were provided with a copy of a driver's license we learned, correct? Yes. You were provided uh, photos of Mr. Swanson while he was alive, correct? Yes. And then you were also provided autopsy photos. Correct. Okay. How many total photos did you receive? I don't know the exact number, but probably 100 plus. You, you don't know the exact number? Not of the total photos of Mr. Swanson that I received. And earlier today, you told us that you took those photos and you put them into three separate folders. Is that right? Correct. One was a super imposition folder? Yes. The next was a trauma folder? Yep. And then the third one was kind of a throwaway? Discard. Discard. So those are photos that you, you didn't need to use. Is that right? Right. How many photos were in the superimposition folder for Mr. Swanson? I don't know the exact uh, number. Some of the photos were used more than once. What about the trauma folder for Mr. Swanson? How many photos were in the trauma folder? I don't know the exact number. This is the same thing that some of the photos were used more than once in, in multiple categories. And did you keep uh, notes of the procedures that you were, were taking? I did keep notes of the procedures, the steps, yes. You didn't keep notes about the number of photos that were in each folder? Not in each folder. The number of photos that I used in, in total for the process I kept. So what was the total number of photos that you used in the process for Mr. Swanson? Can I refer to the notes? Would it refresh your recollection to look at your notes? Yes. Please do so. Uh, it was approximately 84 plus or minus three photos were used. Okay. 
How many of those photos were uh, Mr. Swanson while he was alive? I don't recall. And that's not in your, your That's notes. not in my notes, no. How many of those photos were autopsy photos? I don't recall. And again, you're looking at your report now. You don't have that in your report? I didn't write down how many photos uh, living uh, or uh, after uh, I, I used. You were also provided photos of Mr. Martin, correct? Yes. And fair to say that you don't have a recollection as you sit here today about how many photos you were provided by the Riverside District Attorney's Office? Not an exact number, no. Fair to say that you don't have a recollection of how many photos you used that were Mr. Martin while he was living? Correct. You also don't have a recollection of the number of photos that you used from the autopsy, correct? Correct. I have a total number of photos used. And those are not, those numbers are not anywhere in any of the, the notes that you took during this process, correct? The, the total number is not the individual. And you also were provided photos of Ricky Anderson? Yep. And you, you have a memory of see the number of photos you received for Mr. Anderson? Not the exact number. No. And you don't have the exact number of life photos of Mr. Anderson that you used in the creation of the 3D? No, not, not an exact number, no. Same question for the autopsy. You don't have a, an exact number for the autopsy photos? Correct. Do you have a supervisor at your job? I do. What's his name? Dan Mayshack. And when you had completed your 3D models, did you take it to your supervisor to get his review? No, he doesn't do that. Did you have, did you consult with anybody about the models that you had created? Um, I consulted on uh, some of the positioning to have another pair of eyes to ask. Yeah. Are there any other individuals in your field that you're aware of that do this type of work? Not that did this exact process, no. Did you reach out to anyone outside of your university to get some guidance on how to do this? No. Did you ask anyone to review what you had done to determine uh, that the process was done correctly and accurate? No. So you just, you did this on your own? Did it on my own and sent it to the DA. Okay, there was one person that you spoke to uh, is that correct? Yes. And her name was uh, Leota Noche Dowdy, is that right? Correct. How many times did you speak to her? Uh, I don't recall, maybe half a dozen. Did you put your conversations with her anywhere in your notes? I don't believe so. When was the last time you spoke to her? Uh, maybe almost a year ago, probably. And is she someone that works in this field? She is a PhD student at the university in this field. In, well, in the field of forensic anthropology. Okay, so she's in a different field than you, correct? Right. This morning, you gave me a phone number for her. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. Would it surprise you to know that that number is disconnected? This morning, you also gave me an email address for her. Okay. Did you try to reach out to her at any point after our conversation this morning? Um, I think I emailed her and uh, said that they may be contacting her. Okay, when you say you think you emailed her, did you No, email I emailed her? her and said you may be contacted. Okay, so after you and I spoke this morning, you sent her an email. Yes. And when you say, what, what was the content of the email? It said... Overall, the answer. It said uh, they asked for your contact information and might be contacting you. Okay, did you say who would be contacting? Uh, no, I just said they. 
Did she respond to you? No. Why did you do that? What time did you send that email? Objection relevance sustained. Did you put anything else in that email? Objection. Any false analysis? Overall. Uh, my name. Did you tell her not to talk to the defense? No. Would it surprise you to know that we have tried to reach out to her this morning? Objection relevance sustained. Would it surprise you to know that we have not heard back from her? I have nothing further. Redirect? No, Your Honor. Is the witness excused or subject to recall? Excused. Excused or subject to recall, Mr. Uh, Wilbur? Subject to recall, please. All right, so, sir. Um, He's going back to Florida. Right, understand. So, if he is called back, then defense can make the arrangements if need be. Thank you. All right, so sir, uh, you are subject to recall, so if needed back, uh, we'll let you know, but otherwise you're free to get on that plane and head home. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, next witness. Thank you. You can call Craig Dean. Uh, my name is Craig Ogino, C R A I G O G I N O. Inquire. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Ogino, uh, what do you do for a living? Uh, right now I'm retired. So you don't do much? Uh, not with the COVID going on, no. All right. Uh, do you have any areas of specialty? Yes. What is that? Uh, blood stain pattern interpretation. Uh, and we've also come to know that as uh, blood spatter analysis, correct? Yes. All right. And spatter, again, no L. Correct. Only in the movies do we hear splatter. That's correct. All right. All right. So that's your area of specialty. Will you uh, educate the jury as to your training and experience in that field? Okay. I have a bachelor's of science degree in chemistry from the California State University at Los Angeles. I completed all my coursework towards my master's in criminalistics in 1978. I was a lab aide for the LA County Coroner's Office, um, basically just washing dishes and making gunshot residue kits. In 1979, I was hired as a criminalist for the San Bernardino Sheriff's uh, Crime Laboratory, and I was a criminalist one, basically just analyzing drugs and blood alcohols. In, uh, 1983, I was promoted to a criminalist two, and in that capacity, I started analyzing physical evidence, trace evidence, and studying blood stain pattern interpretation. Uh, 1993, I was in charge of getting the San Bernardino Sheriff's Crime Laboratory accredited. In 1995, I was the lead criminalist at the West Valley Satellite Laboratory. Uh, in 1997, I was in charge of the Crime Scene Investigation Unit. In 2001, I was promoted to supervisor uh, until 2004. And in 2004 to 2008, I was the Crime Lab Director for the San Bernardino Sheriff's Crime Laboratory. Uh, in 2008 and to 2014, 
I was the crime lab manager for the Chula Vista Crime Laboratory. <clears throat> so you have uh, some years of experience in criminalist uh, uh, analysis, is that correct? Criminalistics, yes. Criminalistics. Uh, and at what we've come to know uh, in this trial is that criminalists have various different fields of uh, specialty, if you will. Yes. And one of those fields is blood stain pattern analysis. Yes. Correct? All right. And uh, what about blood stain pattern specifically? Do you have uh, training and experience? Okay. In 1984, I attended a one-week class from Herbert McDonald at the San Francisco PD, and that went over a basic blood stain pattern uh, interpretation, which included um, physics of blood, as well as all the different patterns that are caused by motion and uh, impact of blood stains. In 1989, I attended a class in Florida, a 24-hour class, also going over uh, blood stain pattern interpretation, and another class in 1990. In 1992, I attended a one-week class at the California Criminalistics Institute up in Sacramento. In 2002, I attended several workshops, one being blood stain mapping, another being blood stain uh, documentation of bloodstain clothing, and the third, advanced documentation of bloodstain patterns. Do you know a person by the name of Brian Reinars? Yes. Who's that? He's a criminalist, or he used to be a criminalist for the uh, Riverside Crime Laboratory. And uh, did you actually train him? I believe I did, yes. In bloodstain pattern analysis? Yes. All right. So let's talk a little bit about blood. Uh, if blood is traveling through the air, whether it's a drip from somebody's nose or finger straight down because of gravity or because of energy, it's flying through the air, what shape uh, is that blood droplet? Okay, any blood that travels through space or air, that particular droplet or liquid is gonna take the shape of the object that has the least amount of air resistance. And that shape happens to be a sphere. Or a ball. Yes. So, uh, so much like a baseball being thrown, that's a sphere, correct? Yes. And uh, I assume the reason why we have baseballs is because that has the least resistance in the air, or the shape of baseballs. Yes. All right. Now, when that droplet hits a surface, does it still become? Does it still stay a, a sphere? No. Uh, why not? Well, um, that sphere, again, is a liquid. When a liquid hits a solid object, it now distorts or deforms. Okay, and I'm showing you my fist. Um, we'll imagine it's a ball or a sphere <clears throat> flying through the air like a uh, droplet of blood. And then now if it hits uh, a surface, uh, let's say it lands on a surface, now that's going to change shape. Is that correct? Yes. And as I'm showing you, I'm making kind of a C uh, or maybe a wave, would you agree? Yes. And is that, uh, is that consistent with how it would shape once it hits its surface? Uh, th that's the uh, physics of it, yes. All right, so now I'm gonna show you people's 86. You see uh, that photograph? Yes. All right, and so uh, is there anything in this photograph uh, that you can educate us on as far as uh, the direction this uh, the top droplet of blood was traveling. Yes. All right, and explain that. We have a uh, laser there right in front of you. If you could show us on the screen behind you, that would be great. Um, is there any way I could drop? Um, or, or just try well, to explain. Well, that's it. a little tricky. Okay. Because you're back there and we can't okay. see it, but maybe if you can just explain it as best as you can. Okay, when, uh, when this drop, if the drop comes down and hits perpendicular to the target, it forms a round circle. And do you see that in the exhibit? Yes. Will you show that to the jury? Pardon? Will you, show, will you point okay. that out to the jury? 
the plunge here is in the lower right hand quadrant of, I don't know what exhibit this is, it's in the lower right hand quadrant of this picture. Okay. Okay. However, if the blood hits at an angle, the first thing that ha will happen is that blood stain will hit and then it will flatten out, but it still has horizontal momentum. So a wave will form. Uh, it's going to hit and form an ellipse, and when that wave snaps off, that's where you get this tail. So this particular blood drop that's in the middle of uh, exhibit 86. 86 is traveling from right to left, or it's going from right to left. All right, very good. Now, uh, we, we actually had Mr. Reinhardt uh, testify earlier uh, to a bunch of different exhibits, so I'm going to ask you about some of those. <coughs> Showing you people's 87. Do you see this photograph? Yes. I'll zoom in just a little bit. All right, uh, and is there anything in this photograph that can assist you in uh, blend, blood stain uh, interpretation, pattern interpretation? Yes. And what's that? If you have several um, of those ellipses that we saw in Exhibit 86, uh, and you know the direction of travel, you can dra draw an imaginary line back and they might meet at a certain point, and that point's called the point of convergence. Uh, if you could figure out the angle of those blood stains, and you draw that string back with the angle, then you could find what's called the point of origin. So the point of convergence is two-dimensional, the point of origin is three-dimensional. Okay, and so the point of origin and can you tell the jury, looking at this photograph, where you have an opinion as to where that uh, point of origin is? So in Exhibit 87, if you look at this yarn, they're all meeting in the upper right-hand section of this uh, chair. All right. Now showing you people's uh, 65. In this photograph, uh, let's assume that that is blood uh, droplet on this uh, chair. Do you see that? Yes. Now, is that consistent with the, uh, the around the location of the point of origin? It's close, yes. All right. And now, going back to the previous exhibit, people's 87, see that lamp right there? Yes. Now I'm going to show you a different exhibit, People's 155. Do you see anything in this exhibit that can assist you in blood stain interpretation? Yes. What is that? Remember the ellipses we just talked about? Um, there are some here, there's some here. I'm going to zoom in to maybe assist you a little. right here, uh, and the direction of travel is from bottom to top, or in other words, that particular stain is going in an upward direction. Knowing that, the point of origin has to be below that stain, or where the blood is actually spattered from. And explain that. Why, why are you saying that because they're going in the upward momentum or upward direction, that the point of origin has to be below this uh, Okay, so... And if you need me to go to a different exhibit, I can... So this, again, um, is this 155? Yes. Exact, exhibit 155, if you look at the lamp, right in the midsection of the lamp, approximately two-thirds of the way up, there's a blood stain traveling in an upward direction. What that means is the blood has to come from low to high. So the point of origin, or where the blood is spattered from, has to be below that particular stain. So 
let's kind of uh, reverse it with a hypothetical. Let's say that the droplet showed uh, a downward angle, okay? Would you, could you now say that the point of origin is above the lamp? No. And explain that. Okay. So, for example, let's say I have a downward moving blood stain here. Yes, the point of origin could be above it, but the point of origin could also be way down here, coming up and then down. So your upward moving stains are the most important. Downward moving stains can either point of origin can either be above or below them. And that's due to gravity. Yes. All right. In this particular case, we have upward stains. Is that correct? Yes. And so now we know that the point of origin is below the lamp. Correct. Showing you people's uh, 185. And this is a different angle of, of the arm. Is that correct? Yes. All right. But do you see that the top of the chair, that brown chair, is still below the uh, lampshade? Yes. And is that consistent with your opinion of where the origin of that blood spatter originated? Yes. Sorry, that was a little redundant. Uh, moving on to 186. Another photograph of the angles of the uh, a different angle of the yarn, is that correct? Yes. And still, in this photograph, is that consistent with your opinion? Yes. Showing you people's 184. Yes. Another angle, correct? Yes. And still uh, corroborates your opinion? Yes. Um, when blood spatter happens, let's assume that it's a blunt force object to a head that's causing the uh, blood spatter, okay? The first impact, is that going to cause blood spatter? More than likely not. No. Why is that? Unless there's blood on the surface to be spattered, the first blow, there won't be any spatter. So, for example, if I hit my arm and there's no blood on the surface, there's no blood spatter. But as my arm starts bleeding, and there's blood on the surface, and you continually hit, that's when you're going to start getting blood spatter. So unless if there was already blood on, let's say the person was hit in the head, and they coincidentally had a, um, a bleed on their head, and then they were hit with a blunt object such as a bat, uh, there would be no blood spatter, correct? Not on the first blow. Not on the first blow. Yeah. So the fact that there is blood spatter, uh, do you have an opinion that would most likely be due to multiple blows? Yeah, there has to be blood on the surface for when that bat comes down for that blood to actually spatter. Okay. Now moving on to people's 102. See this photograph? Yes. And is there anything uh, significant in this photograph as it relates to blood spatter interpretation? Yes, there's multiple blows low to the ground um, depicted in that photograph. And explain to us how you know that. Uh, <clears throat> well, let's uh, take these really <coughs> large stains uh, again in exhibit uh, 102. These are elliptical stains, so you can draw an imaginary line back, and they will meet in an area here. However, you also have, I don't know if you can see it, but if you zoom in really close, there's going to be a smaller stain that are going this way, but these larger stains are going this, this way. So the larger stains, there's a point of origin up uh, in the pool of blood. In the pool of blood. However, there's another point of origin over here 
where these little tiny stains are traveling. So there's actually two points of origin within that pool of blood. And for the record, you're uh, indicating to the ellipses shaped uh, blood droplets on the bottom right portion of the exhibit. Now, you said that there are multiple uh, origins. Is that, does that mean we should take that as multiple blows? Yes. All right. And then I also heard you say that it was low to the ground. Yes. How do you know that? I know that because of experience. Uh, for example, if the length of the blood is twice the width, then that blood stain is hitting at a 30 degree angle. You draw a 30 degree angle up, this point of origin in space is just above the pool of blood. And so are we talking inches off the ground, feet, or somewhere in between? Inches. Inches. So multiple blows inches off the ground, is that correct? Yes. And that does not take into account any prior blows that may, may have caused a person to fall to the ground, is that correct? Uh, these weren't caused by somebody falling in this pool of blood. Okay. Th there's a difference. And how do you know that? Okay. The difference is if somebody falls in the pool of blood, now your point of origin is right on the floor. Because it's on the floor, the angle of impact is like one or zero degrees. And if the impact was to this pool of blood, you'll see super long streaks of blood coming from this pool. And I believe there's an example of that in one of the crime scene photos. Okay. Uh, showing you people's 131. Anything in this photograph uh, that's significant? Uh, only that it, it shows the crossing of the bloods even better than uh, Exhibit uh, 102. So this corroborates your opinion that there were multiple blows inches from the floor? Yes. Uh, showing you people's 132. In this photograph, anything significant? Uh, same opinion. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to show you people's 133. You see this uh, pantry door? Yes. Is there anything, and I may need to zoom in, but do you know if there's anything in this photograph that uh, can assist in blood pattern analysis? Yes. What's that? If you zoom in on the lower right portion just past the doorknob to the right and below, you see very small blood stains also indicating impact. right in there, and they also have direction to them. So this indicates a blow higher up, but very close to this target. So where the, uh, looking at this exhibit, it would be near the, uh, the doorknob? Yes. Okay. Now showing you people's 79. In this photograph, you see the pantry door on the, on the left side? Yes. And now you see blood on the, on the ground and also on the wall next to the pantry door? Yes. Now, is there blood spatter there, or do you know? I didn't see blood spatter there. This is just contact blood stains. And what is that? Contact blood stains are, if I have a bloody hand, my hand just wiping a target, uh, it'll leave blood, blood stains, but those stains won't be blood in flight. In other words, they won't either be round or elliptical. So contact stains are caused by blood being transferred from a bloody object to a non-bloody object. Showing you people's 82 in this photograph. Um, you see the blood spatter here at all? Well, I see it, yes. Okay, and if you can point that to the jury. Um, so there 
is also contact stain on the cabinet, real low, as well as the entrance to the pantry here. And what about higher up? Any blood spatter? Yeah, the blood spatter was higher up. Uh, like it look, looks like there's a spot there, and, and what you showed previously. Okay, and again, that was near the doorknob. Is that correct? Yes. And is it your opinion that the point of origin was rather near that uh, doorknob? It was higher up near the near the front of the door. Yes. All right. Now I'm showing you people's uh, 136. And in this photograph, do you see any blood stain patterns that are helpful to you? Yes. And where is that? Uh, this is the corner of the island, and there's uh, impact stains uh, on both of the planes of the, uh, the island. Okay. And then showing you people's 135. Yeah, another photograph, a slightly different angle, same thing? Yes. All right, now showing you people's 140. See this tripod? Yes. And is uh, using a tripod for blood stain pattern analysis helpful? Yes. Why? Uh, what it does is you're now able to not only get the direction, but when you have the angle, you can use a protractor and place yarn at the exact angle and direction of those blood stains, and they might meet in space somewhere. Okay, and uh, looking at this, uh, do you have an opinion as to where the point of origin is for the, uh, for the impact? Yes. Where's that? It's right up at the handle of the tripod. And why do you come to that conclusion? This is where all those the yarn is coming together. All right. Now showing you people's 146. See this? Uh, it's another angle of the yarn. Yes. Now I notice on 136 that two of the yarns to the arm of the tripod come together and converge, correct? Yes. But there's another piece of yarn that does not converge. It goes to a leg of the tripod. Do you yes. see that? And what does that mean? Okay, what that means is uh, when blood spatters, it's going to leave at different rates. So, for example, uh, your larger blood stains will travel further than your smaller blood stains. So, just to give you an example of this, is if I have a glass ashtray and I throw the glass ashtray, I might be able to hit the back of the courtroom. But if I grind that glass ashtray into a fine powder, it's still glass. But when I throw that fine powder, it just immediately goes down due to air resistance. But they both were initially leaving at the same rate. Due to that, when you do these point of origin determinations, it's very typical that not all of these stains will meet exactly in one spot. Uh, the other reason for that is if, if a head is hit or a large surface area, the point of origin isn't a point, it's an area. So if I, my head's hit, it could come out from the right side of my head or the left side of my head, well, it's going to be a little bit off. So going back to your analogy, that's really uh, the mass determines how far the, the blood will go. Yes. So not all, blood drip, not all blood droplets are created equal. Correct. All right. Um, 146. 147. Another angle um, showing the tripod. Yes. Correct. Now, uh, do you have an opinion as to whether this, is this a different uh, point of origin uh, than the one next to the uh, doorknob? Yes. Okay. So now we're talking about, well, Already, since there's blood spatter, it has to be multiple blows, or mo more likely mo multiple blows. Well, that plus the distance is so far away, though the size of the stains you showed me don't travel very far. So it can't be from the one near the pantry. And then lastly, um, 
so many people as men do. Uh, does that also corroborate your opinion as to where the point of origin is looking at this angle? Yes. Thank you. Cross? Yes, thank you. Just so we're clear, sir, you are not at the scene of this event, correct? Yes, that's correct. You are basing your testimony on the photographs that we're looking here, correct? The photographs, the reports, um, um, and there are other documentations I was provided, yes. With respect to, like, we see the yarn in here, you do not know whether that was, in fact, placed properly, correct? Um, well, since I didn't do it, it yes, that's oh. correct. That's going to be my next question. Have you ever engaged in that where you take pieces of yarn and you try to create an angle? Many times. Approximately how many? Well over 100. Thank you. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Mr. Beecham? You trained um, Brian Reinhardt as to how to do the trajectory yarns? I believe I did, yes. Thank you. Anything oh. further? No, no. Excuse me. Witness excuse, Mr. Jensen? Yes. You're excused. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are at the end of the day. Um, so just to give you an update, let you know where we're at, we're not in session tomorrow. We're not in session tomorrow. And your next time back with us will be on Monday. And conferring with the lawyers, it appears as though, can't give you a 100% guarantee because things sometimes are in flux, but it appears as though Monday will be the conclusion of the evidence in the case. Uh, for this phase of the trial. So what that means is is that um, whenever we finish on Monday, if we do, uh, the lawyers and I then will go over the law in the case, and there's a very good chance that the case will be argued to you on Tuesday. Uh, so we are certainly uh, on track with where we had anticipated that we would be for this part of the trial. Uh, now, that's not a guarantee. Things could change, obviously, between now and Monday, but it looks as though the evidence portion of the guilt phase will be concluded Monday and very good chance that argument will take place on Tuesday and you will begin your deliberations at that point. So I remind all of you not to discuss the facts of this case amongst yourselves or with anyone unrelated to the trial, not form or express any opinion until you've heard all the evidence. Have a nice long weekend. 